it is 8:30 and everybody is here. We've done our sound checks, so I'm going to I'm going to kick us off. So good morning to everybody who's listening. My name is Jessica Holmes and I'm currently serving as the interim chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. Today's day 5 of our uh, hospital budget review process, so we're going to be hearing from North Country and Gifford today. Just as a reminder to arrive at decisions for every hospital, we look to our statute, we look to our hospital budget rule for guiding principles. Um, we have to balance several competing factors. On the one hand, we need to work to slow the growth in healthcare expenditures. On the other hand, we need to ensure that our hospitals have the resources that they need to recruit and retain healthcare workers and to provide the care that we expect in our communities, high quality care. So as we attempt to balance that cost containment, access, quality, and, and health system sustainability, we have to be mindful of this year's significant headwinds. We have historically high inflation rates, we have workforce shortages, we have provider burnout, and we're still facing the impacts of COVID-19 um, at all of our institutions. And we've been hearing a lot about that through all the budget hearings that we've had so far. So both nationally and in Vermont, we know that hospitals are facing unprecedented financial challenges as our businesses, families, and, business, and individuals. So over the next few weeks, the board is going to be working to approve uh, fiscal year 23 hospital budgets for the 14 community hospitals that we regulate. But I just want to remind everybody who is online today that the board is working very closely with the Agency of Human Services to begin the work that's outlined in Act 167, which really aims to move us closer to a sustainable hospital system that ensures that Vermonters have access to high quality, affordable care. That work is going to involve extensive data analysis and community hospital engagement. But the hope is that the end result is a more sustainable path forward. So as we turn back to the hearing today, I just want to extend a thank you to both North Country team and the Gifford team for the time and effort that they've taken to submit the documents for our review. We know it takes a lot of time and we appreciate the effort there to help us understand your budgets. There's a few housekeeping notes about the hearings today. Uh, this presentation is a public meeting. It's being recorded and transcribed, so there will be a publicly available record. If at any time a hospital's leadership team believes there's some confidential information that the Green Mountain Care Board should consider, either as part of your presentation or in response to board or staff questions, just let us know. Because if needed, we can go into an executive session and review confidential information from hospitals. Executive sessions would be limited in scope as uh, defined by the open meeting law and limited to information such as contracts and information that would be considered confidential under the Public Records Act. So if an issue of possible confidentiality arises, I will call on our legal counsel to determine the scope of what could be discussed in that executive session. And then if, if it's deemed appropriate and at the appropriate time, I'll just ask a board member for a motion to go into executive session. So with all of that said, I think at this point we can uh, proceed with North Country's presentation. I'm gonna hold all board and staff questions until the end to allow you to kind of get through the presentation. Um, and with that, I'm just going to ask our legal counsel, Russ McCracken, to swear in North Country's witnesses. So anybody who's planning to present or even answer questions today, if you could participate in the swearing in process. Great. Thanks very much, Chair Holmes. This is uh, Russ McCracken, uh, attorney for the board. Um, for the North Country team, who is planning to be uh, speaking today? Uh, yes, it's... Uh... Uh, myself, Brian Null, Tracy Paul, Megan Sargent, Paul Giordano, and Dr. Stephen Perlin. Great, thank you. Uh, if you would all raise your right hands. Uh, do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I do. Great, thanks very much. Uh, you're sworn in and I will turn it back to uh, Chair Holmes. Great, thank you so much, Russ. And just my other request is that everybody make sure that their uh, microphones are on mute other than those who are speaking so we can avoid any kind of feedback or background noise. Um, but with that, North Country team, Brian, I, I will happily turn it over to you. Yes, thank you, um, Jessica. Um, I assume you guys will be able to put the PowerPoint up on screen. Um, I think the, the hope is that you all can share it, but if not, I think Kara, who is one of our staff, um, could also staff members yeah, who would that, navigate that. But if you have, yeah, so have we presume that that would be easier if you guys did that and 
Okay. Um, is that okay? Can you put that? Yeah, Kara, okay. can you pull their presentation up? She is right okay. on it. All right, thank, thank you. Kara. And we'll just tell you next slide. Just let me yeah. know when you need me to advance. Yeah, we'll just we'll say next slide. So, and you can go to the next slide. <laughs> um, so thank you all for um, meeting with us today. Um, again, this year, um, as we go through the, the the budget process, our presenters today are uh, myself uh, as a CEO. I've been here for uh, four years, and Tracy Paul, who is our chief financial officer, um, and and does manage other departments in the hospital. Um, she has been with the organization for 26 years in our uh, um, in the CFO, uh, the VP role for three years. Megan Sargent, our VP of Patient Care Services, um, and she's been with the organization for 16 years um, and in, in her current position for two years. Paul Giordano, uh, VP of Human Resources, has been with the organization for one and a half years. And then Dr. Stephen Perlin is our radiologist um, and has been serving in that capacity for um, uh, nearly 15, if not more than 15 years. And um, and we created this the chief medical officer role for the first time within this last year. So he's been serving in that role for under a year. Next slide. So just a review of our mission. Um, uh, and it hasn't changed. It's to provide exceptional care that makes a difference in the lives of our patients and our community. And we have been um, here in the Newport area for over 100 years and um, continue to evolve and adapt um, with technology, um, the, the service lines that we offer, um, and, um, and, and tend to be here for 100 more years. And um, so we're happy to share our story of what's going on this year and what we project for the coming years. A reminder, next slide, our, a reminder of our next, uh, of our service area is um, what's unique in Newport is we're really, we serve like a half circle uh, because we're right at the Canadian border. So um, one of the few places in the country that um, has this dynamic. Uh, we ser our service area is somewhere in the vicinity of 30 to 35,000 um, um, residents. And um, it's 45 minutes uh, to the closest Kirk Access Hospital, two hours to the tertiary care uh, facilities being Burlington um, and uh, at, down at Dartmouth in New Hampshire. Uh, we do attract uh, staff from Canada, um, uh, but we we have very little um, health care provided to Canadians. It's really just in the emergency care setting um, that we see Canadian residents, uh, mostly because um, back in the 70s, uh, Canada did does not extend stopped extending their health care coverage going into into the, the state. So. Um, so that's that's a, a little di different flavor than um, some other areas of, of our state. Uh, and then the next slide, and I'll be handing this over to Tracy in a moment. Um, when we submitted this uh, overview of our projection, um, it was July 1st, and our net operating income loss at that point was $1.1 million projected for the remaindering of the year. Uh, we started um, uh, our integration into our new EMR service, our, our new EMR system on um, mid-May. And so we've been 90 days in and it's been very difficult and challenging navigating that. And you'll hear about that story a little today um, and its impact on um, our short-term situation here. Um, and so we've had really little access to um, solid data on our performance. And um, I'm, unfortunately I need to report to you today that after closing out, um, through the month of, of um, July, we now project a loss of $5 million. So we've had a ter terrible um, last three to four months uh, on our operations and our, our um, operating margin is not projected to be a minus 1.2, but instead a 5.25% uh, loss operating margin. And um, you know, reflecting back on our budget, asked for last year for the 2022 budget, we had asked for a, a operating margin of 2%, two, 2% two um, and our rates were adjusted to where our operating margin would be 1%. Uh, and so you're gonna hear through today the stories of, um, it doesn't take much on the critical access hospital um, and perhaps other hospitals in our state to swing um, that operations to the negative. So although we've had a couple of years of good performance um, and even navigating through the pandemic, 
Um, we have a lot of more pressure points on our system um, that were, an were anticipated for the current budget cycle. And, um, and we've tried to anticipate that in the future budget cycle, but even since submitting um, the budgets from projections in um, earlier in the year, uh, everything is changing so fast that, um, that we we're continue to be challenged with um, projecting out towards what the future will look like. Um, and it seems to be um, in some circumstances, day to day, week to week um, assessments of what's going on in our current state and the environments that impact our operations. So I, with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Tracy to, to, to share some. So good morning, everyone. Um, as Brian mentioned, later in this presentation, we're gonna cover a lot of the changes between um, our original projection and our new projection and for budget next um, year. So next slide, please. So for the 2023 year, we are asking for a overall fee increase of 12.4, excuse me, 12.45%. This is to cover the large increases in expenses that we have occurred through FY22 and that are going to continue to occur. We're projecting into FY23 and to allow for a 2% operating margin. Um, the net revenue NPR is an increase of 12.5%. This is basically made up of two different components. One is the rate increase and the reimbursement payer mix change, which accounts to about 34% of that 12.5% increase. And the other majority of it is utilization increases from budget 22 of $7.4 million, $7 million. The major increases are in the ER and also in some of our ancillaries, lab, radiology, um, specifically in the area of CAT scan. Next slide, please. Continuing on the um, revenue side of the house, basically for FY23 proposed budget, our other operating revenue is decreasing $503,000. That decrease is directly attributed to a decrease in our 340B revenue. We've seen a decrease in 340B for the last three years. Um, we're actually engaging an outside consultant to evaluate us be, and evaluate us becoming part of the 340 ESP program, which would help us to hopefully recapture some of that revenue that we're losing. The non-operating revenue shows a decrease of $849,000. Basically, we showed gains in last year's budget and we're showing a small loss for this year. Um, as everyone knows, this is very, very difficult to project. Um, so these numbers could come out basically anywhere, but this is what we have in our budget. Uh, next slide, please. So let's move on to talking about the expenses. This graph shows what North Country Hospital's expenses growth have been from 20 into budget 2023. Uh, basically, it's a 10% increase from budget 22 or $9 million. Next slide, please. So the major expense drivers out of that $9.9 million, 3.6 of that is actually inflationary um, increases and 3 million of that 3.6 million is compensation and benefits. Uh, locum and travelers are up $2.2 million. Supply costs are up $1.5 million. Um, costs we've occurred during this year and also um, projecting further increase in costs for next year and also an increase in our provider tax. Next slide, please. Now I'm gonna turn this over to Paul, our VP of Human Resource, who will discuss this slide. Good morning, everybody. Um, North Country Hospital has seen a, an increase month over month in, in certain areas of metrics as far as vacancy and turnover. Uh, as far as vacancy, we had a high of a little bit over 11% for vacancy uh, for all positions within the hospital. Our RN bedside nursing vacancy was as high as 27% um, earlier in this year. We are currently uh, at 16 to 17%. Uh, we anticipate that will normalize a little bit over the next several months as we have uh, several new grad RNs and orientation that will come off in probably about six months. If everything maintains the same and we do not have any more uh, high uh, turnover, 
uh, we should be probably closer to 12% uh, in the nursing vacancy at that point. Uh, as a critical access hospital, we have to understand that we have a smaller pool of employees to draw upon. So in some departments, if one person leaves, it could be a 25% uh, turnover or vacancy rate. Uh, we do not have the resources to move back and forth between departments or shifts or have uh, per diems or part-times work additional hours because they have been working that. So uh, we have uh, experienced some work of burnout in which we've had to address through that. Our turnover rate for this year, for the first six months is 13.8%. Uh, just in comparison to last year for the overall hospital, it was just under 10%. So as you can see, this year has been a, more of a challenge than last year it was. Uh, our, vac our turnover for nursing and bedside RNs is a little bit over 22%, whereas last year it was just under 9% at this time last year. So uh, that's, you can see the struggle that we've had uh, in different areas, and it's been across the hospital, not just in specialty areas for nursing. Uh, in reviewing it, we see that med surge has, for the first time in many years, has had to have some locums put in in that area. So uh, I will now, I will speak later on some more slides about recruitment and retention. Uh, I'll turn it over to Megan Sargent right now. Great, thank you, Paul, and good morning, everyone. Um, so some recruitment and retention efforts that we're doing specifically on the nursing front. Um, we have a generous tuition reimbursement. We offer loan repayment. We offer sign-on bonus for um, new um, nurses to our facility. Um, we offer referral bonus and longevity bonus as well. Um, we here at North Country have a strong shared governance model um, and unit practice council um, that feeds into this decision making. We also um, have a nine month new grad residency program um, so that we're helping new grads um, really build a foundation, um, a, a healthy foundation in nursing and supporting them throughout almost that first year um, where we know that um, um, retention is important. Um, we've also um, invested in bedside uh, unit educators for nurses that are new to specialty and for the new grads coming out of residency. Um, again, to support them um, in their efforts um, in, in developing their nursing skills. Um, lastly, we do, as a nursing leadership team, offer a Rockstar Award to um, recognize um, at the bedside level um, when uh, people are doing a good job, um, and that's peer-to-peer, -peer, um, and they hand that out to each other, um, and they look forward to that every month. Um, next slide. Um, again, so going back to recruitment and retention, one thing that we noticed was that our compensation, we had to make some changes there to be competitive. Uh, not the hospitals no longer just compete with themselves. We compete now with the nursing homes. We compete with the, the local other industries such as Walmart and the grocery stores and even the little uh, uh, stores around town. Uh, so we made a commitment to increase the minimum wage to $15. Um, we have a longevity bonus that we now give to employees every five years. They receive that. Uh, we also did a comprehensive uh, market rate adjustment across the organization. Um, and then the hospital traditionally has given uh, regular rate increases. Um, as Megan said, we do a lot with uh, the employees. We now we do referral bonuses. So if employees refer, an applicant and they are hired, they receive a referral award. Uh, there's a sort of recruitment and retention initiative. Megan mentioned sign-on bonuses. More and more, we're having to uh, find employees outside of our service area. So that incurs an additional cost to us. We are paying for relocation expenses. We have um, started a program in the last several months where we do a search for employees all throughout New England, down into New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. We've even been able, been able to get some employees from uh, some other states in the Midwest and uh, to recruit. No longer can we just recruit in our same area. 
Um, those are some of the things. There's a whole host of other activities we do with employees uh, to recruit and to retain them. Next slide. So for the proposed budget, we want to, again, continue the longevity bonus, uh, some additional market adjustments as necessary, uh, rate increases, uh, the referral incentives, and continue all the programs that we're currently using um, for, um, that we put into place in the last year to two years to attract and retain our employees, to make us the employer of choice uh, within the Northeast of the Kingdom. Next slide. And I'll turn it over to Tracy Paul. Yes, so this graph you'll see uh, represents our compensation benefits and local expenses as a percent of our total expenses. Um, from FY20 to the 22 budget, you can see that it's pretty flat. Um, this should continues to tell the story we've been speaking of that we went up to almost 66%, and we're um, seeing this level off for FY23. Next slide, please. Continuing to talk about locum expense, um, this is a graph that shows the total locum expense as part of our overall salary expense. And again, same story, relatively level from 20 to budget 22. You see a sharp increase to 16% um, for projected and then a decrease to about 9% in budget 23. Um, just to put some dollars to this, in budget 22, we had $2.4 million budgeted for travel expenses. We're projecting $7.6 million for traveler expenses. And we budgeted in budget 23, we're budgeting $4.6 million worth of travel expenses. And you can see the number of locums at the high point on the um, bottom graph is 22.75. But as Brian stated earlier, that's um, that projection is already too low. Um, we've had to add two additional lab techs, um, as well as four nurses in our ambulatory clinics, which is something that we haven't seen before either. Um, our projected uh, back down to 14.75, um, how we're going to get there is really um, our strongest um, influx of nurses comes from our new grads. Um, we have a strong partnership with VTC. Um, we're a clinical site, um, and we we often see our new grads coming from there. Additionally, um, looking um, to recruit, continue recruiting um, for new hires. Next slide, please. So this is a graph graphical representation of our operating margin um, from FY 2016 to budget 2023. Again, you can see that FY22, we're seeing a large decline um, to the $5 million loss that Brian was speaking of earlier. But basically, there's three reasons for that loss. Um, revenue decreases due to specialty provider loss, specifically in the area of our general surgery. Revenue decrease due to the EMR conversion. Um, and traveler costs. Year to date July, we were at $4.6 million over budget. Um, which is something we've never seen before. Um, the supply and pharmaceutical cost increase, and among other things. Next slide, please. So this slide shows basically in numbers what we've been talking about. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we need to update the 22 projected that actually should see say a loss of $5 million or 5.25%. Um, for budget 22, we had asked for 2%, we got 1% um, for $981,000 for an operating margin. For FY23, we are requesting a 2% operating margin of 2.2% operating margin of $2.1 million. Next slide, please. So I'll cover this slide. I, I want to point out that I think there was an updated slide deck that we might have sent um, that has um, some of this information. So Tracy, do we do you know who you sent that to? Just so in case you can pull it up while we're 
talking? Um, it was uploaded into Adaptive. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I don't know if you can just email it. Um, just in case you guys want to see that, you know, that updated deck, but we will talk to um, some of those variations from this report. Um, so just, you know, looking at the marketplace, um, you know, we're, we're just looking outside um, Newport area and saying, okay, what's going on with, with the hospital environment. So this was just a reference to a Kauffman Hall study showing operating margins were um, pretty stable for the first part of the year through December. Um, and that's what it felt like for us too. We were off track with budget, but we were still doing um, okay. But then the bottom fell out with us needing to get more locums. Um, we had some turnover in specialty um, physician practices uh, that's impacted our um, margin as well. Um, and um, and so what we're uh, and in, in addition to that, we talked about the Cerner transition, which has been a, a, a um, continuing strain on the organization. Um, we, so what we're doing right now is we're getting extra eyes um, on our operations. So we've we've um, contacted and uh, with um, formerly known as BKD, um, our audit firm, and we've asked them to come in with extra eyes um, to help us to continue to look at validating what we're what we're navigating um, and also enhance um, anything that we may not have eyes on that we um, need to focus our time and attention on. Um, so they'll be looking at not only um, our revenue cycle so side and the Cerner transition, uh, revenue capture, co co um, co um, collections. Um, they'll be also looking at um, margin improvements um, across supplies, group purchasing opportunities, um, our employee benefits programs, um, uh, and other areas that, um, that, that may have some, um, um, some opportunity. Um, we, I feel personally, I feel like we're we're at the point where we're starting to scrape the bottom of the barrel because we always look for these things and improvements, and we always will. But um, I don't know that there's going to be, um, at, from what I'm looking at today, there's going to be a huge swing in improvements, except for um, replacement of positions, um, and that will start to bring things back in line. But um, the cost of locums, um, in many cases, exceeds the. Um, the, the normal cost of operations, um, but we need to continue to provide um, medical care for our community. So it's a it's a uh, conundrum because you need to be here and present 24/7. We don't have the privilege of like re restaurants and other businesses that say, okay, well, we're not going to be open on Saturdays because staff don't want to work, or um, we're picking which days we're going to be open. Um, we don't have that um, luxury. Um, so we we remain committed to staying open and providing um, exceptional patient care, but it's a this is the co current cost of doing business. Um, in addition, they will also um, and they'll be revisiting with our board as well. They'll also be giving us a current state of marketplace um, overview of what they're seeing across the country to give us perspective. What are what are other organizations doing, um, and how do we how do we pair up with with those um, endeavors? Next slide, please. Brian, I'm just going to switch to your current slide deck. OK, perfect. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Sorry for the trouble. <laughs> OK, thank you. Yes, thank you very much for doing that. I appreciate that. Um, so obviously this is a balance sheet. Um, the biggest thing to know here is our drop in cash, which I'm going to discuss in a second. So if you could advance to the next slide, that would be great. So here's our cash flow without the Medicare accelerated payments from 2019 until now. You will obviously see the slight, the major decline in FY22 projected. Basically, it's threefold. Um, on obviously, like the rest of the um, hospitals, we are continuing to pay back Medicare dollars. Um, the also the losses we're experiencing is affecting our cash flow, and one of the major reasons that significantly impacted it is the transition to Cerner. As of April, we had a cash balance of $8 million, and now you can see we're down to less than a million projected for the year end, um, and we also have had to draw uh, $2 million on our line of credit. 
Um, we did not anticipate such a large decline in cash. Um, in fact, uh, prior to conversion, we put into place a billing company um, to help with the Cerner billing to minimize this. Um, what happened at Go Live after May was that we realized that there was a lot of setup issues um, that significantly delayed the start of the billing and uh, the outside company can't bill until things are set up in internally. Um, the positive news is that we anticipate gaining back this cash. Um, we are working through the billing revenue and volume issue, issues associated with Cerner. Um, and we've seen a lot of um, action on that front. Um, so we're anticipating for this cash to come back. Um, next slide, please. So to discuss the change in the charge request and how that is affects the payers um, in regards to Medicare, we only receive net revenue on the outpatient piece of the outpatient portion of Medicare. Medicaid, a charge increase does not net any um, additional revenue. Commercial, inpatient and outpatient does net more patient revenue. Um, for North Country Hospital, 1% of charge equates to about $692,000 in net revenue. About 68% 68 of that or $470,000 is from the commercial payers. Um, and the other 32% is from outpatient Medicare. Um, in regards to bad debt and free care, uh, consistently for a very long time, we track about 2% and it's usually split almost evenly between 1% of bad de debt and 1% in free care of our gross revenue. Next slide, please. Good morning. I'm going to discuss the joint venture between North Country Hospital and Northern Counties Healthcare called Northern Express Care Newport, uh, which is a walk-in clinic, uh, which opened on July 11th and has been quite successful. The uh, One of the intents of this venture was to try to shift low acuity uh, visits from the emergency department to the walk-in clinic. Uh, one of the uh, advantages of Express Care is its location on Main Street in Newport, uh, which is an aid to our socioeconomically disadvantaged uh, patients because this is within walking distance uh, for many of them and uh, uh, avoids the necessity of having to uh, drive the drive to the hospital, to the ER, or uh, undertake transportation, say, through RCT to get to our ER. So we believe that this is uh, uh, an effort to increase health equity for our patients. Um, I'll now turn it over to Brian to discuss the Wellness Center. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Perlin. And, and this is just a short list of um, internal um, and external things that we're doing to really advance the communities um, on the community's needs um, and improving community health. So we're happy to partner with uh, Northern Counties as um, um, Dr. Perlin shared. That is an operating expense. Um, it is not a profitable venture, but it is something that's right for the community. Um, and it's only been open for probably five weeks now. We have seen, uh, we have seen, it's too, too soon to tell, but we've seen some um, and, um, some variances in our ED volume. So um, if we were normally in the 40s, uh, mid 40s, we seem to be hitting in the 30s um, for, as far as patients per day. Um, so we also are impacted by the revenue on the ED. Um, and as, uh, um, on top of the, you know, the uh, expenses to help um, open up and operate express care. Um, the Wellness Center is something that um, we have had for 25 plus years where it offers programs um, and is um, really its purpose is to attract um, those that uh, uh, through our, our programs and activities to uh, focus on um, their health and well-being, whether it be physical um, or mental. And, um, and, and so we've been offering that. Um, it does cost us uh, over $100,000 um, to operate that. We would like to invest more in this, but this is something we can't do because we don't have, you know, we need a stronger operating margin, um, you know, a 2% or greater to be able to, to, um, to offer this. And so we would like to actually infuse more capital and energy into this, this um, endeavor and build it um, and actually see our, our dream would be that it would be 
you know, money spent on this and invest in this would serve a greater proportion of our population. And we have some ideas for that. But this, because of our operations, we have to put on pause. We can't we can't get to where we want. Um, and I think this is something that is important because it's something we invest that will, will um, um, pay dividends, you know, five, 10 years down the road. It's not a short term thing. It's influencing people um, uh, short term and long term. Uh, um, and then um, for the next two, I just asked Megan to take over. Sure, thanks, Brian. Um, so we also on our online uh, learning platform, we have a mandatory training for cultural diversity um, at North Country Hospital. We know that showing respect for our patients' cultural, uh, spiritual, or gender identity is part of providing the overall care for the person, and we want to do that well. Um, also, we have an initiative, um, Hospitals Against Violence, um, which uh, again is supporting our staff and patients to feel safe um, on our campus and to we know that when our staff feel safe they're providing better care for our patients. Um, we initially rolled this out in our emergency room with signage and um, a redefined workflow for our um, staff who may experience violence. We partnered with um, our community agencies um, with the Newport Police Department with Human Services um, to really um, define that, that workflow. And now um, we've expanded it across the campus um, into our ambulatory settings. Next slide, please. We were asked to discuss wait times as part of our presentation. Uh, one point I want to make is, as we've said before, mid-May we did a, Cer a Cerner conversion. Um, during the first three to four weeks of that Cerner conversion, we purposely decreased our provider schedules by up to 50% in order to help make that conversion more successful. And of course, this has affected our patient access during that time and going forward. And we um, we did engage with uh, 3D Health. Um, we use them every three years to look at our physician needs assessment um, and um, help us develop, design and develop our recruitment and succession plan. Um, they forecast that based on our population current um, demographics and forecasted demographics um, to help us uh, establish what our community can support across all specialties. Um, and we, this year within that, we asked them to also um, do a survey on um, um, appointment access by specialty. And we just met with them um, two days ago. And so I'm just gonna share with you those preliminary results. And um, and I, I have to say that this is tempered by um, this process happening during the, the Cerner go live. So um, as Tracy said, that impacted our schedule. So um, these, these numbers are above average for um, national but um, I, I would hope that we would be able to, um, through our recruitment and retention and then normalizing Cerner, that these would improve. Um, but this is current state. So for family medicine, um, we are an average of 50 days wait time for establishing a new, um, new establishing a new um, relationship with a, with a physician. And that's uh, 27 days over the national average of 23. Um, internal medicine, we're 53 days over the national average of 25. Uh, and for pediatrics, we're 40 days over the national average of 19. Um, so we, we, we acknowledge these wait times. Um, it, it doesn't surprise us because um, we, we believe we're about short, we're short about three physicians right now, just in primary care. Um, and then in specialty care, we're recruiting for um, general surgery uh, because of a turnover there. Um, so we're, we're short on uh, general surgery coverage. And, um, and so we'll continue to, 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 to keep our eyes on this. Um, but I do acknowledge that um, another impact of this is during the summer months, um, for the first time, um, people are taking more time off across the organization. So that PTO, particularly with providers that paid time off, is impacting our schedules as well. And we've had some that have even traveled out of country to visit um, loved ones that they haven't seen um, in, in quite some time. So, um, so that's, that's uh, again, just news that we um, were able to acquire just uh, two days ago. Next slide, please. Yes, and to follow up on what Brian was just uh, discussing, uh, we have several 
uh, transitions, recruitment, and retention efforts across the physician spectrum. Uh, in general surgery, as Brian noted, we are operating under a deficit of general surgeons. Uh, we have been recruiting vigorously uh, to replace general surgeons that we have lost. Um, in the process of doing that, we have engaged a uh, employed per diem general surgeon who's contributing about 10 days to two weeks of time for us. And we're in the process right now of negotiating with another uh, general surgeon who would um, take the same role as an employed per diem, also uh, 10 days to two weeks of time. Uh, so if we can secure that general surgeon, that will be a, a significant uh, improvement um, due to these transitions in this deficit. We're certainly experiencing a significant uh, revenue deficit uh, from that revenue stream. Um, cardiology, um, our prior cardiologist uh, has moved on to another position. Um, just within the past few days, we have uh, secured a contract with a new cardiologist who will be starting with us uh, in mid-January. In the interim, um, we are uh, engaging two locum tenens uh, who will each work one week a month. So we will have two weeks per month coverage, uh, which we believe will enable us to um, maintain continuity of care within our cardiology service and allow our patients to continue to be seen uh, at North Country Hospital rather than having to uh, go to a tertiary center. Um, pulmonology, um, we uh, suffered a loss of our pulmonologist um, last year. Um, since that time, we had engaged um, services from Dartmouth to fill in. Uh, that proved to be an untenable model. And uh, at this point, we are no longer offering uh, pulmonology services at North Country Hospital. So again, there's a loss of revenue from what is essentially the closure of that service. Um, we are currently undergoing a stabilization in our hospitalist program. Um, we have secured three hospitalists, three, three physicians um, as members of our hospitalist team with a one in three rotation uh, to provide work-life balance uh, in that um, area. Uh, we're also attempting to recruit three nurse practitioners as nocturnists uh, in the hospitalist program. Uh, again, three people to provide that work-life balance. The, uh, the recruitment of those three nurse practitioners will uh, increase the, um, the costs of this program, but we believe it's necessary to establish that work-life balance for both the physicians uh, and the hospitalists. Um, other hospitals do have an all-physician model, um, so our costs are somewhat lower by recruiting nurse practitioners. However, um, this is an increase uh, in expense based on what we have been doing uh, in the past. Um, primary care, um, one of the major transitions or stressors that primary care is undergoing now, as has been uh, alluded to previously in this presentation, is the implementation of the Cerner EMR, which has proven to be uh, difficult from a primary care standpoint, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, has decreased um, on a continuing basis the number of patients that um, our providers are able to see on a daily basis. So that is one stressor that they are undergoing. Over the past number of years, we've suffered a number of uh, retirements of physicians, some um, illnesses. Um, our model has transferred to um, somewhat more uh, APPs than physicians in our primary care system. We are recruiting vigorously uh, to uh, equalize that. Um, we do have a, a primary care provider coming on with us in mid-October who's uh, moving here from Cleveland. So we're looking forward to her arrival. Uh, and as I say, we are continuing to vigorously recruit um, for primary care physicians. Um, we've had some success recently in uh, orthopedics. We have recruited 
a second full-time orthopod who will be starting with us in mid-November, and that will certainly increase our orthopedic access uh, here at North Country, and we believe that that will be a very vigorous program going forward. Next slide, please. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor Perlin. Um, and so, you know, overall, um, no surprise here. Um, staffing shortages. I'm he I'm sure you're hearing this <laughs> from the other um, hospitals, but we're having staffing shortages across all positions. Um, physician, clinical, and non-clinical. Um, we're dealing with wage wars across multi-industry, um, competing with people that are leaving the industry, um, and, um, and and then also within with our hospital settings. Um, and, and really, um, a lot of changes going on because of work-life balance challenges, um, and we're doing our best to um, to, to balance that. Um, we had, for example, um, a provider who had a um, pending um, illness of a loved one um, and, and needed to be with that loved one. And so we were able to, for a period of 90 days, have that, that provider work offsite out of state, um, providing care um, in that particular specialty at work through telemedicine. Um, so we created that work-life balance so that person can continue working, serving our patients here and also serving the needs of um, their loved one. Um, we have, but we have, we have a sad stories with, I, we've lost in the last year, we lost an ER and a hospitalist um, um, and their, their um, early careerist and they have completely exited um, the industry, at least for the time being. Um, we lost a um, APP just uh, to retirement um, and, and we have several others that are approaching retirement in the next couple of years. Um, um, with a, this one particularly wanted to transition out before a change of the EMR system. Uh, we lost a geriatrician internal medicine doctor who completely burned out of providing care in the long-term care setting. And I know you guys are hearing about the challenges with long-term care. That was a solo provider in our community and so immediately um, jeopardized and has jeopardized the coverage there. Um, which is a challenge not only for our organization, but I know it's, I think last I heard it was about 14 different communities having this, this or nursing homes having that, that type of challenge. Uh, we have, you know, staff taking le medical leave um, and taking care of themselves. So just as we've heard about people delaying medical care and now accessing medical care, care that's the same for our workforce. Our workforce, we've had some um, that have had to leave um, um, for extended periods of time, which has also led to more locums use uh, because they needed to take care of them themselves um, or family members. Um, and then even when they're returning for various reasons, um, if they return, um, they're returning uh, not in full capacity. So they're dropping from a full time to a part time. And so we're not getting that full coverage back. Um, and, and we continue to look at, um, you know, the challenges with remote work as it relates to a competitive. Um, we've lost um, um, leaders and um, frontline staff. Um, clinicians to um, other industries where they're able to work completely remote. Um, one more recently um, is has left or is in the process of leaving and um, will be able to work um, six months down in um, in a, a more warmer state and um, six months up um, here when it's nice in the in the, the warmer weather um, of the opposite part of the season. So. Um, those are the types of things, and and that's not even a healthcare. It's well, it's healthcare, but it's not a hospital um, centered. So those are the things that we're we're um, continuing to navigate, um, like many others, of creating a work life balance um, for our staff, but also being able to continue to meet the demand of 24/7 care. Next slide, please. Um, uh, and our risk and opportunities um, uh, with our uh, continuing that. Um, these are really our goals for our EMR system. Um, I'm not going to read through those. That I'd highlight one medical record, um, enhanced patient portal. Not on this list is the transition from Athena was necessary. We did not. This was not uh, something we wanted to do. It was something that we needed to do because the, our Athena um, product stopped supporting hospitals, um, and we're just decided they changed their their model after being purchased um, to just support the ambulatory environment. So our our goal as an organization for 
a number of years has been to have uh, advance one medical record. Um, and um, and so this is that was um, a great deal of reasoning for selecting Cerner. So it added cost and duress to the organization to go through yet another conversion. Athena, we were only on that product for uh, about four years. Um, next slide, please. So, um, so you know, with, with uh, stable operations equals stable environment of care um, and long-term reinvestment um, in our, into our infrastructure. So, uh, you know, we don't believe 2% operating margin is a big ask. Um, it may sound like a big ask, but we need a stable operating margin so we can continue to invest in the thing in the, in the, the infrastructure. Um, we haven't poured in, over a number of years. We haven't actually been able to put money into our investment, our long-term investments, because we've had to redeploy it to um, our immediate capital and operating needs. Um, so we'd like to get back to the place where we can do that. Um, and it's our long-term investment portfolio that will actually be serve, um, that will be financing a project that I'm about to tell you about. So our hospital campus here, um, although we're over 100 years old. Um, and I, our first main hospital, it actually still stands. We built things to last, but our current campus um, and current location, uh, we, we arrived here in 1973 um, and um, has grown over the years. We, in 2019, we started a facility master plan. We do about every, we conduct every seven years or so to see what are the areas of a high need. This was, well, this was paused obviously because of COVID, although we had line of sight to what direction we believe we were going. Um, and then we integrate, we re, um, energize this um, um, at the board's um, at the board's direction and later 2020 um, as we're um, starting to normalize COVID. Next slide, please. So um, so I want to first of all thank um, the Green Mountain Care Board for the approval of our certificate of need that just happened a few weeks ago um, and uh, just highlight what again um, for everyone what this project is. And, and emphasize this is a long term project. So regardless of our current duress, this is something that um, we have. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll pause, we'll think about what's going on in the marketplace um, and um, how we continue to support this. So this is not breaking ground tomorrow, um, but we're just getting to the point where we can be shovel ready um, when the environment's right. So the project is a new addition of 20,000 square feet and a renovation of 22,000 square feet. It's uh, to consolidate and improve the multi-floor inpatient care departments, which will actually help us with the staffing, uh, reduce some staffing. Um, we're not we're increasing staffing in this, this um, new design. Um, it's really to sustain staffing. Uh, it provides a larger lab for um, and replacement of our, our lab um, to house the you know, modern day um, equipment um, and the space necessary so that uh, those, those, um, those larger machines can operate efficiently um, and also expands our emergency department. And this may sound counterproductive to our discussion about express care and trying to reduce the emergency department volumes and unnecessary encounters. But we do in our emergency department, we need enough exam and treatment rooms to spread um, those patients. Um, um, we had for ex we, we've had um, instances where we have people waiting in the waiting room and we would prefer them to be triaged and waiting in a, an exam and treatment room where we can help control um, and monitor them um, during their stay. And so um, this is actually to expand um, uh, treatment rooms and offer, offer some more modern um, exam and treatment space within the ED and would be built within the existing ambulance bay. So I wanna again, just thank you for, for the board's approval on that. Um, and um, and we, we will continue to look at this as our long-term strategy um, and, and really looking at what the environment is. We are pursuing, um, we, we met with the city this past week to um, go, come together to ap apply for a community uh, grant up to a million dollars. It's a competitive grant. Um, and then we're also working um, on new market tax credit strategies all to, and, and the, um, um, the effort to reduce the overall cost of the project. Uh, and then um, last thing about this project um, is that our, 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 we use our long-term investments as a leverage to get competitive debt um, on projects such as these 
and we're, we intend to use the, the long-term portfolio to pay for this yeah. project um, so that it wouldn't be coming out of our operations. All right, and I'll, I'll uh, ask for the next slide and turn it over to Tracy. <laughs> And that hammering sound is not me. There is no construction <laughs> going on. <laughs> well, I'd like to echo uh, Brian's thanks to the Green Mountain Care Board for um, approving our project. Um, and also, so for FY23 capital budget, we're requesting $3.6 million in capital spend. 58% of that is for medical equipment, includes such things as a new mammography uh, unit, um, additions to our orthopedic tower, 28% of the spend is technology, uh, laptop replacements, storage upgrades, and 14% of this is a facility spend. Next slide, please. In regards to our value-based care participation, we participate in Medicaid, Blue Cross and NVP with One Care Vermont. Um, you've heard a lot about avoidable ED encounters. Um, this was something that actually the Green Mountain Care Board spoke to us about last year when we had this hearing, and also the reports that we um, received from One Care on a quarterly basis points this out. Also, that we are high in this area. So, as you have heard, um, again, we have been successful in opening a walk-in clinic um, and being part of that to help address this. Next slide, please. Great, so here um, is actually the ribbon cutting of our walk-in clinic um, that we're um, partnering with uh, Northern Counties with to um, re reduce those um, avoidable ED visits. Um, as Dr. Perlin had stated earlier, we know that it's early, it's only been open for a few weeks, but we are seeing um, some, a little bit of decline in our ED visits. Um, they're seeing, a, the walk-in clinic is seeing about 18, an average of 18 visits a day. So um, we'll be, um, anxious to look at the data over the, for the next year to see the impact on that. Uh, next slide, please. So we know that value-based care um, is about right treatment, right time, and right setting. Um, currently, this slide um, outlines some of the uh, challenges that we have providing that, um, specifically in our emergency room. Um, and this is across the state and the country, uh, boarding mental health patients in our ER. Um, is uh, often uh, delaying care for other patients and um, is is not the um, really the right setting um, for the mental health uh, emergencies. We love to be able to screen them medically and see this patient population move on to the appropriate care setting where they can immediately receive the um, care that they um, need. Um, transfer volume and delays. Um, we see this again and what happens in our ER is we end up boarding patients um, because we're not able to transfer uh, patients out to our tertiary centers um, because of um, their backlog of patients as well. Um, and what that happens in our 11 bed ER is um, between boarding both types of patients, we now effectively have maybe seven beds to um, see our um, other ED populations um, throughout the day, um, which causes such a bottleneck um, so and, and delays in care. Um, on the post-acute patient side, um, as a critical access hospital, you I'm sure you're all aware that we're allowed to use um, our beds as SNF beds, a nursing home level bed. Um, but uh, once again, um, if we're not able to move those patients into the appropriate care setting in the community, which would be um, into a nursing home um, or rehab, um, they um, end up uh, spending uh, longer amounts of time on our acute floor, which then um, you know diminishes our ability to take care of acute patients because we are held um, at a critical access hospital. We have 25 beds and that's what we have to offer our community. Um, you know, and we understand that uh, nursing home and rehab are battling the same problems that we are um, with staffing. Um, there are actually more licensed beds than we're using currently in our health uh, health service area, but um, the facilities do not have the staff to staff those beds, um, so so they're they're staying empty. Um, so those are some of the challenges that we're facing currently. Um, next slide. 
So this is in regards to the supplemental data monitoring that you wanted us to address. Um, when it comes to the market share data that we were given, there wasn't anything in the data that really stood out as a large change. It did show though that we did um, lose a little bit of our commercial revenue um, from 19 to 20. As far as the reimbursement analysis goes, there wasn't anything from that information that I could really see any differences to know on that. Um, Megan? Yeah, so, um, and on the demographic report, um, we know that we have a high percent Medicaid population. We also have a high percent of dual eligible patients, so both Medicare and Medicaid. And what that tells us is we have a high elderly population that lives on an incredibly fixed income. Um, and um, so we also know that from uh, other surveys that we have high rates of obesity, poverty, and high blood pressure in our health service area. When you put all that together um, and you're, we're making budget assumptions and planning, we know that based on our population here in this health service area, it's going to take more resources to care for this population. Next slide. All right, so in conclusion, you've seen this slide before. Um, we're asking for a 12.45% overall fee increase for budget 23. Uh, next slide, please. And basically what that's made up of is the expense increase um, of $9.3 million, which is 85% of that charge request. And out of that, 68% of that is going to direct labor and 20% of that is going to supplies. Um, and of course the other 15% is going towards a 2% operating margin of $2.1 million. Um, so that concludes slide? our oh, Go ahead, Brian. <laughs> yeah, that concludes our presentation. Um, there's a question slide, but um, I think you can probably take that off the screen and um, thank, for, thank you for your yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, before, Kara, before you take it off the screen, could you, um, sorry, Brian, I just wanted to, since I know we didn't have the full slide deck, the updated slide deck, could we just go back to slide six, if that's okay? I think that may have been the slide where um, it's the profit and loss statement, and if it's been updated, I just was hoping you could go through that slide with the updated numbers, with the projections for 2022 updated, if that's possible. So, Kara, that would be slide six, if it's been updated. Yeah, Trace. Tracy, was that slide 17 that you updated? And I, I think you said that, that the yes. first slide was active, so it was hard to update. Yeah, so Jessica, the slide that I have as part of the PowerPoint was the slide as of when we you know, submitted the budget as of July 1st. And I didn't know if it was appropriate to put something different on there than what we had submitted for July you know, July 1st as part of our regular submission. Um, and that's why I put that slide into that um, the slide deck. But um, as I spoke to, obviously, our revenues are less than projected and our expenses are higher than projected, uh, basically, which has made the $5 million. But I can, I'd be glad to get you more details and give you a, you know, an overall profit loss on the projection after. That would be helpful. I was, that's what I was going to ask for in my question. So I'll just save that question. I don't have to ask, but this slide, it would be helpful to have this slide updated for us with the new column for the 2022 projections. So we understand what the revenues now are, what the expenses now are, obviously right. both trading and total and all that. So yes, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much for that, for, you know, for the presentation. Sorry for that little diversion. Um, and I think what I'm going to do now, we've been doing this and I think it's been really helpful, although it's only been an hour. Maybe we should, I'm, I was wondering if we, often we take a 10 minute recess to allow the board to kind of compile their questions and give everybody a chance to stretch and refuel, but we're a little bit ahead of schedule today. So let me ask other board members, do you want that 10 minute recess now or do you want to trudge forward? I could use the 10 minute recess. Okay. Since you often launch the questions, I'm going to absolutely give that to you. Okay, so everybody, we will be back here at 945. Give everybody a chance to stretch their eyes. We'll we'll compile our questions, and, and thank you so much for that presentation. So we'll see you back in 10. Well, I think at this point, I am going to turn it over for board questions, and I am going to start, as promised, with board member lunch. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the 10 minutes. It allowed me to get a little more organized. Um, so first of all, I want to say thank you very much for looking at the ED utilization um, and moving forward with the walk-in clinic. That's great to hear. 
Um, and I look forward to hearing more about that and the impacts on the ED avoidable use in the future. So that's great. That's really terrific. I'm also sorry to hear about the headwinds that you've been facing. It sounds like there's been a lot of challenges in in addition to uh, what I would say are the challenges that we're hearing from every hospital around travelers, staffing, burnout, workplace violence. On top of all of that, it sounds like you also have had a EMR issues um, and a lot of uh, actually more staffing challenges than many of the other hospitals. So I am very sorry to hear about those headwinds. Um, I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into your uh, utilization assumptions that you outlined on page two of your narrative. Um, so, and it's also, um, I think, outlined in your presentation on pages 25 and 26. So, but just starting with page two of the narrative, um, it looks like you're anticipating overall from the financials sort of a, a, a nearly flat utilization, but that you are seeing some increase in the ER um, offset by some of the avoidable use, uh, increase in patient days that aren't COVID related in med surge, um, and increased volumes in radiology that seems tied to the ED and um, lab. So could you just speak a little bit to why you anticipate that these volumes will uh, be maintained and kind of connect the dots for me with some of the vacancies and provider transitions that you outlined on pages 25 and 26. For example, um, we often see that decreases in access to primary care does have a direct impact on labs um, and radiology. So if you could just kind of give us a little more commentary on those moving parts, I'd really appreciate it. Um, so I would be glad to start with that and uh, let my colleagues fill in wherever that I'm missing. There's a there's a lot to those questions, obviously. Um, so uh, when we you know when we work on the, the utilization, basically we you know we're working on this in March and April. So we're taking actuals, and that's always our base stone, right? We're taking and then we're looking at what do we concretely know from April to the end of the year um, to get our projections, um, and then we take that and do that again for next year. Um, as far as trying to, so for the ER, um, after COVID, our ER utilization came up really slowly, but then finally when it came up, it hit. And that's what some of the increased utilization from budget 22 to budget 23 is. And of course, we've seen tracked always that whenever the ER utilization goes up, labs and re everything radiology goes up along with it. Um, so that's the, I guess, the rationale for that. Um, right now, we don't see that changing. I did make a small, we did make a small adjustment for the avoidable ED visits based on some conversations with people who have had this, or CFO that's had the same thing happening in their community. Um, we're not sure if that's the correct adjustment, obviously, because we didn't have any data at that time and we're gonna continue to monitor it, but we felt that there should be a decrease in avoidable visits. Um, and to go to some of the to some of the service line impacts with the physicians that we talked about um, in regard to general surgery, we've had three general surgeons in the past. The budget reflects one was done in January, one done got, got done in May, um, and basically our budget reflects two. So we have the one who's still here, and then we have the, um, at that time, we were thinking it was going to be locums to basically make up another full time. Um, since that point, we now have a situation that Dr. Perlin talked about that we will have two docs job sharing. Okay, so we basically went from three general surgeons to two, which is part of the revenue drop, um, because at that time, also, any of the um, potentials for surgeons were more likely going to be someone graduating next July. And again, nothing, nothing on a dotted line, right? Um, but we would know that we, chances are that we wouldn't see any new surgery until next July. You know, things happen and somebody could fall from the heavens, uh, but that hasn't happened. So that's what's happened with the general surgery. And of course with that, you know, PACU decreases, anesthesia decreases, you know, there's, there's impacts across the revenues. Um, as far as the cardiology goes in the budget, um, I did not budget cardiology for the first, um, quarter of FY23, um, hoping that there would be, um, you know, or projecting that there would 
be a, a, a cardiologist in January, and I did decrease echoes and nuclear stress test. We did um, to offset that, knowing that that would be, you know, that's the direct ancillary um, result of not having a cardiologist. Um, pulmonology was completely removed from our budget, so there's no uh, professional revenue in there or the ancillaries are not a high generation, but anything that we thought was, you know, we did decrease a little bit in the ancillary for not having a pulmonologist. Um, and the primary care transitions, um, I think when it comes to access for that, basically we're saying that we need more doctors. So by, ba so by basing our budget on the doctors we have right now, seems like a fair assumption, like these numbers aren't increased based on that knowing we need more primary care to increase access, they're based on what we have right now. So, I mean, that's a really good question, Robin, but none of that is built in here about having any more primary care besides the Dr. Lane who's replacing someone that, you know, has left. Um, and anything else? Did I, any other things? Yeah, that's great. Okay. That's great. I wonder if, do you have a sense of the impact on your revenue from the, drop in general surgery, the cardiology and pulmonary issues? Um, yes, it's all built into the budget. I'd have to go back to my detail sheets to tell you the actual numbers. I will tell you the, the general surgery impact is a big one. Um, and I'd be yeah. glad to give you those actual numbers afterwards because I have it all detailed out. I just don't have it, have it at my fingertips right now. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, always, always you know, fine if, if you need to follow up. Like Yes. We don't expect you to have it memorized. Certainly. <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> that is, that would be quite a feat. Um, great. Thank you very much. That was super helpful in understanding kind of the background behind uh, those numbers. Um, also on the ortho, um, do you, you mentioned when you were going through your wait times, your wait times for primary care, do you have wait times for ortho? Like I'm wondering, do you have some pent up demand for uh, the second ortho person that you're having start? Right. Yeah, ortho, so ortho, um, so let me let me also share that the orthopedic that's um, that's the addition actually has already been coming to the community and in but we're working here part time and um, decided to buy a home on the lake, the beautiful lake that Jessica mentioned earlier. Um, nice. And so basically is flipping from um, from um, more full time in the Littleton to um, to our community, so um, so so we already have him part time in the community. Um, so so our our survey really was really reflective of the existing practice and um, the skill set of our you know orthopedics has different um, expertise. So sure. Uh, so that actually felt like it uh, you know and this is initial, but it looked like it was pretty close to the the national average there, and in orthopedics. People are tending to they tend to go to the specialists where yeah. they get the expertise. So we we know that there's a lot that leave town that will go Got to, it. you know, other areas. Does that make sense? I'm yeah, yeah. You're basically anticipating with additional time you'll be able to recapture some folks that are yeah. leaving the community. Um, yeah. And perhaps yeah. even get below the national average on the wait times. That's that's my that's, takeaway. Let me know if that isn't right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's very common for me to be like at a community meeting and hear, oh, I'm having a knee surgery or something, and and they're 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 not having it here. They're having it out of you know out of area. Sure. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um. So in so I wanted to ask. Uh, a little more detail about the um, commercial rate increase. Um, so when I look at Appendix 1 in your submission, your narrative, let me just pull that up, um, which is the reconciliation table that walks us through uh, budget to budget and projection to budget and understanding that your projection has, has changed. Um, when I looked at this exhibit um, in terms of budget to budget, it seems like your NPR is an overall increase of just under 11 million and 8.6 of that is coming from rate. Um, and in the projection, um, the 
the increase from your old projection, understanding this is old, was 8.9% and 8.6% of that would be coming from rate. Um, so the question that I had about that is related to the critical access hospital status and um, your cost report. So what we've been hearing from a number of other critical access hospitals is that they, because of the cost-based reimbursement and the ability to file the cost report and get some enhanced revenue from Medicare to reflect that the fact that your expenses has have increased, that that has given the ability for many of the critical access hospitals to not ask for large rate increases this year because there is that protection and Obviously, not all your patients are Medicare patients, but as you noted earlier in your presentation, you have uh, what you're one of the oldest communities um, with high Medicare participation. So could you please uh, provide some more justification for the rate increase given um, sort of what you would or what I would expect the uh, impacts of the cost report might be and also whether the cost report impacts are reflected in the budget or not yet? Yes, I'd be glad to. So, um, you. you know, about 30% of our gross revenue is Medicare. So we'll start there. Um, and just as a reminder, you know, any additional physician costs for professional services um, do not receive cost-based reimbursement for Medicare. You know, so that's a piece of the cost um, yep. that we will not get any increased reimbursement for. Um, and basically what it comes down to for North Country is um, from the allowable cost, right, which we know was a sugar down of all our total costs, we would see approximately a 30%, 33% of that cost is what we would get. Um, I will tell you that it is not in our budget. Um, historically, we have not put it in our budget. Um, you know, we have reserves for these things, basically yeah. because we have seen these Medicare cost reports, you know, almost swing on a dime sometimes for different things. Um, so we do not, you know, we do not put those, you know, we do not put that in our budget. Basically, you know, we'll do an interim cost report um, before we close. We'll have our, the final cost report will be done at the end of February of next year. And then at some point after that, we could get an interim rate adjustment. But um, we feel like all of that is too I want to say iffy, which is not a technical term, but it's not it's not concrete enough in order to be able to put that in our budget. And we think the rate increase is necessary. We can't we can't. There's nothing black and white that shows that we're going to get that money now. Um, and to be able to jeopardize the future from now, like I said, the cost report won't be even filed till the end of February, and we wouldn't even start to see any money until sometime after that. Um, and you know, and there's desk reviews and audits, and so it's hard to say when our our rates would actually change, and we'd actually see any kind of pickup on those dollars. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so in in looking at the net patient revenue increase, um, from uh, it'll be very interesting to, to get your updated projection because the increase. Um, quite frankly, from both your budget and your the projected number that we have to the 23 budget mm -hmm. is, is quite large. And in the past, what we've seen, particularly with critical access hospitals, is that um, it's been difficult for them to, to span that large, that big a, a jump. And I think I'm sort of in, from in looking at your materials, it seems to me that the reason why there's more certainty for you in this shift is because of the rate increase. Am I, is that accurate, would you say? Is that interpretation of the numbers accurate? Um, I'm not sure, Robin, if I completely understand exactly what you just stated. Could you yep. say that again sure. for me or maybe of, someone else can help course. me? <laughs> no, of course, of course. Uh, so, Typically with critical access hospitals, when they come in with, for example, a 12% NPR increase from budget to budget or 10% from projected, yeah. like it's been very difficult for them to actually oh. reach that. And so, uh, yes. so okay. in the past, we've talked about um, aspirational budgets where yeah. uh, the top line isn't really achievable. So you're yeah. kind of baking in a loss yeah. essentially yeah. because yeah. you're building yeah. your expenses to a top line that's not achievable. And I'm 
you know, I'm basically just repeating what Maureen Yusufer used to say. Yes, I, yeah, I learned yeah. this from her. But <laughs> yeah. what I'm trying to tease out is it looks like from the um, reconciliation chart that actually most of that increase budget to budget or projected budget is in the rate, which means it's more certain because yes. of, you know, once your price goes up, your price goes up. Yeah, thank you. That that helps me. Um, and yes, the answer to the sure answer to that question is yes. That is why it's more the majority of it is the rate and also the utilization that we're increasing. I mean, I believe it's pretty solid, you know, um, so it's both. We do. I mean, we do know we I mean, we now have line of sight to when orthopedics comes online and when um, when cardiology comes up back online. Um, general surgery, we have, you know, historical on that as well. So I think that's, you know, when we look at it, that's what we think is conservative. And uh, as far as uh, not jumping too high, because we've been there before, um, just a matter of getting back to there, um, because it only takes one provider to leave and then it's... Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the provider changes special. really impact you a lot. A yeah. lot. Yes. Yeah. On our ancillaries, a lot. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm almost done. So um, in terms of your traveler's budget, um, thank you for providing the information and um, the presentation with a little more detail on it. Um, can you talk a little bit about the hourly? A lot of hospitals, it's helpful for us to hear about kind of the hourly assumptions that you're making because a lot of the other hospitals have put it in those terms. So it, it's good to be able to kind of see what's happening around the state and if there's consistency or not. So could you just speak a little bit more to the traveler hourly numbers? Megan, Megan you would you like to speak to that? Yep, I can. <laughs> um, so um, in, in actually reviewing the hourly rates of our current, tra current, current nursing travelers that we've had here, I saw far as far back as 2013 where we used to have travelers for $70 an hour. I know you all know that that's not the current state. And then, no, no the high point of that, um, we had $200 an hour. Where we're landing right now is um, our high point um, is about 140 um, with a low point of uh, 95. Great. So it sounds consistent with other hospitals, like those numbers are starting to come down. And do you know what you used as the budgeted number? Um, Tracy, do you know what we put in our spreadsheet? Actually, I think we kind of went somewhere right in the middle, Robin, because we were using some of the projected dollars and then on the new dollars of what was coming in. So I think we probably went somewhere right in the middle on those rates to be conservative for our traveler dollars. Okay. And I, I don't know if you guys are hearing this, but I've heard from a couple of um, people that have said, um, and I don't think we've experienced this yet, but that the rates are may may go up in the fall because of large systems trying to acquire mm -hmm. the talent ahead of time um, for possible surge, which is discouraging because that would impact our supply as well. Um, sure. But we we have the mindset of we're looking at every. In fact, we're talking. We have a meeting later today to talk about what what opportunities do we have to lower the, even the existing traveler rates? Um, but there's a there's a risk reward there. Um, and um, so for example, if we go, um, I think this is, this is correct. Um, and it, it could be de contract dependent, but if we say, hey, we have a, a, a someone in mid assignment and we say, okay, we wanna drop your rate by $20 an hour. By having that conversation, we may, we may, um, um, allow for the opportunity where that they won't, they don't need to, even if they say no, they don't have to stay for the remaining part of their term because we tried to negotiate a new term. So, okay. so we really, we definitely look for at the time of a change at the end of a cycle, or we're looking for additional replacements because we know that they don't stay for, you know, ever, and we have to replace them with new people. We look every time we look at an opportunity, we post the rate low and then we, we ratchet it up um what that rate we're giving until we get the need met great thank you um and so my last question um it's really a sort of a ex trying to put your con approval and project for the ed into um context for uh really 
your patients and others who might look at your budget and say, hey, you're asking for a big increase in price and you have this big project out there that you're saying you're going to spend millions of dollars on. Um, how would you answer that Newport resident who was wondering about what's what I think to most people would see as kind of a, a dis, you know, inconsistency? Yeah, yeah, it's a very good, very good question. Um, and one we would have hoped not to have to even respond to because we would have had a stable operations. And, and so, right. so try to break it apart for, for example, that um, just on the ED utilization, for example, if I can start with that, the ED utilization um, is a factor um, in our in our model and um, we do want to drive down that. But we have, when we say 11 beds, that's not 11 beds in rooms or it's not, a. Uh, so we have people um, that are in the hallway within the ED and they're not in a, um, in a an appropriate um, care setting that we would like to have. So we're stretching our existing space to accommodate. So some of this growth would just say we're putting people in a room rather than in a hallway. Um, and um, there's just a whole host of reasons why that's good. Um, and then um, so so that's 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 on the ED utilization side. The um, the overall project um, is a long term need. And we have said from the beginning that this would be funded through our operating or through our long term investment portfolio. We would leverage that as that debt uh, um, for debt. So we have, um, you know, I think, well, the market keeps changing. So um, we had at one point sixty million dollars there. So um, on a twenty eight million dollar project, um, we just seek to use that leverage to um, cash out. We use that as leverage to pay for it. So then that's not affecting the current operation um, of the hospital because that's being financed through that mechanism. Um, and that gets back to why I say, you know, it's important for us to have a operating margin, um, you know, year after year, because that allows us to reinvest into our ongoing capital, but also um, into that long term. Because if we if we disintegrate that portfolio, it's it's the beginning of the the um, of, of a crisis um, um, and it's just it's just punting forward and then we're gonna have a crisis where we don't have any cash to to, to invest in our infrastructure and um, make sure we have appropriate care environments so um, this I hope that gets us on the you know helps at least have a conversation and on the right track of separating the two um, that's long term what we're talking about is you know current state Thank you. Um, that's it for me. Thank you, Robin. Great. Thank you, Robin. I'm going to turn it over to Tom Pelham. Well, good morning still. Um, I found myself a couple of times thinking, looking at the screen here and seeing a TP and the lights blinking as if I'm talking and I'm not talking. <laughs> it took me a minute to realize that's Tracy Paul. That's not Todd Bellum. <laughs> so there's two TPs up there. Nice initials. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, TP. Um, I, I, kind of following up on a couple of um, areas uh, Robin touched. Uh, one of them is Medicaid, uh, the NPR revenues in Medicaid. And in both your uh, payer mix table and your reconciliation table, um, you have a fairly large uh, increase, $3.9 million um, um, in Medicaid revenues, not attributable to the rate, but attributable to utilization. Um, and that's uh, a third of, of y y your overall NPR increase. And so I'm just wondering, um, you know, also kind of looking at 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 uh, Medicaid across all the hospitals, um, uh, their the the projection increase um, is just 1.4 percent. Uh, most hospitals, I find, don't expect you know much additional revenue uh, from Medicaid. So I'm I'm just wondering kind of what what you're thinking behind um, the Medicaid number that you're proposing for, and and that that the difference from uh, 2022 to 2023. 
Um, okay, so as far as the actual reimbursement for the net for Medicaid, um, I was using when I went from the budget, um, it's based on what we're actually receiving. So that was, I didn't put any increases in there. Um, it's the combination between what we're getting from traditional Medicaid and what we're getting from the ACO um, for our Medicaid. Um, Medicaid is about 25% of our population. So there, were, there are no increases built in over and above what we are actually seeing year to day. So we, I did not build any increases there. Um, I'd have to go back, Tom, honestly, and specifically look at what the assumptions in 22 were when, when that budget was built. Um, but again, this budget was built on what I was actually seeing for what I would call traditional Medicaid and what I'm actually seeing for, you know, um, the FPP from the Vermont One Care. And that's how the, that's where that percentage came from. Well, that might, it might be helpful if we just could get a little window on whether or not uh, this increase, uh, and you know, it's obviously the right thing to do is to base it on what current revenues are or the current experiences, uh, but just to see what if this current experience is, uh, you know, has a longevity to it, um, right. you know, over time because it it's a big number, it's a thirty yeah. percent increase, and um, um, and and it's totally independent from front, you know, from the rate increase. Right. Um, I'd be glad to my, show a, a crosswalk across Tom of how yeah. that how that came out. Yeah. Um, my my next area uh, has to do with travelers. I guess I mean it's a a topic uh, uh, in you know, with all hospitals, but there are a couple of uh, lines uh, that kind of caught my eye in your narrative. Uh, um, one is I'll just read a couple of here expenses from projected twenty two to. Budget 23 are forecasted to decrease by 1.1%. This is due to the projected decrease in travel usage because of new uh, the new graduate nursing hires and other staff hires. So that's one. Um, and then later on, um, uh, the, you have uh, uh, um, talking uh, again about um, you know the overall increases a uh, decrease. The new grad residency program mentioned above has filled many positions be, uh, beginning in May. So I'm just wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about this new grad residency program. Absolutely, Megan. I can feel that. Thanks, Tracy. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, our new grad residency, as I in the presentation talked uh, briefly about, um, we offer a nine month program. Um, and if you've seen any stats on nursing, you know that there's a high turnover in the first year. If they come into the profession, they're unsupported, they're highly likely to just turn around and leave. Um, forget about the rest of the years in nursing. Um, so um, it was about five years ago that we really invested in this new grad residency program. Um, our education department, pretty they, they run that nine month program. It's heavy on the front end. Um, providing support and training um, and then tapers off towards uh, the end of the nine months. Um, and what that's done for us, um, this is previous to this year, um, we typically see, I think the lowest amount that we've seen come through are seven new grads and we've had um, classes as large as 12 new grads. Um, as I said, also we partner with VTC as a clinical site um, so that we have that feeder line. We also offer externships to nurses in um, bachelor's programs heading into their senior year. Um, we often see them come back in the spring to participate in the new grad residency program. Um, so how that impacts this year is, um, uh, you know, looking at our increased traveler usage and then in those opening positions, um, where perhaps in specialties we might not have filled new grads before, we adjusted our new grad residency program to really support new graduates going into specialties. Um, that is coupled with the support from the unit-based educators um, so that they're really, um, we're, we're trimming down our orientation time in order to move those travelers out and move the new grads into those permanent positions. So is it fair to say that um, this program is one that's kind of locally based? It's uh, um, it's it's something you you folks have put together and and uh, um, and uh, made real. Um, yeah, there other hospitals have new grad residency programs, um, and I'm thinking of the critical access hospitals uh, throughout Vermont. Ours is the longest. 
and um, the most time intensive. So later on in the narrative, just to kind of continue on this thought a little bit, um, you uh, in the narrative you listed, um, you, you say North Country Hospital has implemented numerous programs to attract and retain qualified team members to provide the service to the community. And then you list a few um, signing bonuses, uh, referral awards for existing employees, relocation assistance, loan repayment, et cetera. And then conclude that paragraph by saying, unfortunately, there are no outside funding sources for these additional expenses of higher salaries and other programs. And so that um, I'm, I'm trying to get a sense um, of the kind of state strategic plan workforce uh, development program, which uh, they came to the board um, and presented last uh, um, October. So it was like nine months ago. And I think we all thought it was a very good uh, profile of opportunities. But um, um, what I'm trying to get now is a sense, is any of that filtered down to the local level um, where these programs are um, uh, the ideas, the recommendations of this workforce group are becoming um, re real opportunities for hospitals. I'm not yeah. aware of any of that. No, I don't know about anybody, anybody else on the team. Yeah, I've yeah, been part of, oops, go ahead, Paul, I can't hear you though. No, nothing has been brought up to us about, you know, funding sources. Paul, I, I can't hear you, I'm sorry. No. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm on the HR Directors Committee for Vermont. Can you hear me? Barely. Yeah. He, Paul, Paul was saying, I think, Paul, I'm kind of, give me a thumbs up if I capture this, but he's on the HR Director Committee for the state and um, and they, they digest these things, but I don't think there's been anything um, as far as actual dollars flowing through. Um, and Tom, I think I think even the, 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 the challenge for the state will be um, having that set at something that's competitive for everyone. So, for example, if if a nurse is going to get a loan repayment of, I'm just making this up, but two thousand dollars a year, we may have to be at a four thousand dollars. So we still probably would have to supplement it. Um, so anything that would flow through to help the organizations, we also participate. Um, Paul participates in AHEC, um, and that also provides loan repayment that we um, participate in for um, providers. Um, and a lot of those times, if they don't get it through this, through that program, we still, we still end up covering it. So we try to say, hey, one way or another, you're getting the scholarship. Um, we have actually this, this weekend um, on Sunday, and there's still time to, to, to come, but um, we have um, a golf scholarship that raises, um, I think, thirty to $40,000 um, each year. And we give out scholarships through that. So we do supplement it with um, these types types of fundraisers, um, but, you know, unfortunately, it's just the, com the competitive nature of things. We just continue to have to find ourselves contributing more from our operations. Um, and, and that scholarship program, by the way, is, is in um, scholarshiping people that are in school, um, and we don't even have a guarantee that they're going to come back here. We, we we try to build that in, but and it's sponsoring people that are, you know, four to six years out as they're in med schools and nursing schools. So I did have a balance sheet question, but Jess has already kind of hit on that, uh, and it's a it's a moving target. So um, we'll, we'll talk about that some other time when we get the updated balance sheet. Um, and I think finally there was one more. Um, so when I first came on the board, it was probably in 2018. I came up to North Country and visited with you um, a couple of times. One time with Kevin, where he tried to convince uh you folks that he was really from the northeast kingdom because he was from rutland um and i was from arlington and that that's part of massachusetts so we had that conversation at your board meeting but um and um but just when i first met um at the hospital one of the comments that struck me was um obviously recruiting um has always been a problem for north country um and it's it's not and it's obviously just being you know, uh, ex exploded with, with with the pandemic, um, and so we were talking about some ideas about you know trying to uh, get new staff to come and stay, and 
maybe mortgage subsidies or some housing programs and, and things of that sort. It was just a general conversation. And uh, one of the comments was, is that there is a tension in the community um, between the folks at the hospital that, you know, have great jobs and get paid well, et cetera, relatively, you know, to the, the kind of underlying um, employment base of the area. And I'm just wondering um, if that, that uh, still exists and has it changed uh, given that we've gone through a pandemic and the relationship with the, with the hospital and the community is, uh, is, is tightened rather than um, still a bit fractured? So um, unfortunately, none of us were here during that, that visit. Um, um, so I can't offer that perspective, but I don't hear that sentiment in the community. The sentiment in the community is, you know, um, we need more, we need, we need more physicians. Um, um, you know, what we, we need, I don't, they're not rock, I don't think they're going around saying we need more nurses, but they acknowledge that we need more of those. Um, we do try to do incentives for, uh, or we, we, we have, and we've done some stuff with that. We, per, we have a couple condos that we own to help um, out with, with, um, with housing needs. Um, and uh, that, that's, that's been helpful even in our locum setting. But um, I don't get the sense, and I'll, I'll turn to the team here or just be looking at you if you feel like that there's anything of that nature. I don't think there is. No, Tom, I've lived here my whole life and, you know, worked here for a good share of it. And I don't believe I've ever, I've never felt that way, um, you know, here at North Country. People usually are very appreciative of having this hospital in their backyard, per se, versus the option of traveling at least 45 minutes. So um, that's kind of the under, that's the kind of take I get. Well, and I well think I'm, ha I'm happy to hear, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say from the perspective of, um, you know, over the last couple of years, like you, you alluded to, um, things kind of leveled in the playing field. Um, you know, nurses at the hospital don't make an absorbent amount of salaries versus uh, nurses in the long-term care. Actually, some of our long-term care places around here are paying better than <laughs> the hospital and the prison likewise. Um, so, you know, it seems like the, maybe the disparity is somewhat equal now, but yeah. I, I also have been in the community for a long time um, and I haven't heard anything recently to that effect. Well, it wasn't a big deal. It was just kind of a um, an off off the cuff discussion, and I I'm just glad that you're just disabusing me of it. <laughs> um, the uh, I think that that was it for me, um, and uh, I'll throw the ball back at Jess. Great, thank you, um, Board Member Walsh. Thank you, Jess, and good morning, Brian. It's nice to see you again. Yeah, you too. I'm Stephen, Paul, Megan, Tracy. It's nice to meet you. Um, thank you for you, you did a really uh, thought a nice job outlining the headwinds that that you're facing. It was very clear, um, very transparent, honest, um, and I appreciate that a lot. Um, I don't have any real real questions per se. I just wanted to say that I appreciate your effort. Uh, focusing on primary care and the urgent care and ED development and trying to decrease um, the avoidable admissions uh, through the through the ED. I think that that's a really wise um, area to focus. Um, and I, I say that based on experience uh, from other places in the country with with rural settings where sometimes the choice is to try to grow out of the situation that, that a similar situation to yours by focusing on um, bringing in one or two specialists. Um, but the, the cycle that tends to happen then are prices rising, right, to try to make up for, for revenue, but the community can't pay. And they then choose not to have elective procedures or not to go to the doctor but they still get sick and have accidents. So they end up going to the ER, right? Then they're sicker um, than we would hope and they're admitted. Um, and then in our current setting in Vermont, there's a log jam, right? Where people are in and overstay their diagnostic code. So the reimbursement from Medicaid, Medicare um, isn't sufficient. Patients, um, I don't know specifically about your policy, but often patients 
are still billed for those extra days, that becomes medical debt, right? And the, the site then, uh, the bottom line looks worse. And so the choice is to raise prices. And you can see this cycle um, that can be really detrimental in a community. Um, the way through it, the places that I've seen go through it, the focus is on strengthening primary care um, and, and urgent care and access, uh, affordable access. So um, I liked hearing about your focus on that area. I think that's spot on. So um, again, thanks for um, thanks for presenting to us uh, transparently and forthrightly and helping us see the, the situation you're in. Back to you, Jess. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Um, so this is a question I've been asking all the hospitals, so you probably had a foreshadowing of this, but trying to get a sense of the historical relationship between change in charge and what really is the effective rate change for the average commercial patient. So I'm what you know, you're asking for a 12% change in charge, um, could you translate that into what the effective rate increase will feel like for your typical commercial uh, patient? Realizing that obviously, I think you've said this somewhere in your narrative, but that there isn't, you know, that um, pair, different payer contracts mean that, that that change in charge will be implemented differently. So for the average typical commercial patient, what is that effective rate increase going to be? Mm -hmm. I guess I should have had a better foreshadowing, Jessica, because I'm not quite sure how to answer that question. Um, okay. Well, here's what I would say is that if you could, obviously that sounds like a number that you can't off the top of your head compute, totally understandable. If you could follow up with Sarah, that would be helpful. And yes. other CFOs are, are, are tackling this. Some of them had answers right, prepared, others didn't. So, okay. you know, maybe understanding how some of those calculations yes. are being made by other hospitals, that Absolutely. would be helpful. But we're trying to get a sense of that effective yeah. rate increase because yeah. Yeah, from all to. that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, it does seem like there is a deviation, and we understand that there is. So it's just understanding that would be helpful. Right. Um, and then this is just a slight addendum to Board Member Lunge's question about you know kind of unpacking the revenue losses that you've experienced. I just would add, could you also add to that list uh, quantifying what was the fiscal year 22 revenue loss that was associated with the Cerner conversion? increased PTO time, loss of providers, basically some of those reduced patient appointments that uh, potentially are short term, although I guess I'm not sure about the PTO time. That may be a sum summer event every summer. So really interested in some of these one-off Cerner conversion reduced uh, patient appointments impact. And Jessica, we will do our very best to, to do that estimate. You know, it's easy to, not easy, it's easier to do it the direct um, you know, effect from in the practices, the harder part is to try to figure out what the ancillary effect of that will be on, right? Um, on the labs and the radiology and stuff. And so that's where the challenge is, but we can definitely provide, you know, some estimates that we can come up with. And again, you know, we're thinking we're going to recoup that at some point, right? But with the access, that's a challenge also. Understandable. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my next question is actually around in the narrative. Um, this was in the section around average daily census and occupancy rate. Um, I noticed that your average daily census was pretty stable at 16.9 in 21 and 16.8 in 22, projecting a 16.8 again in, for 23. Very, very steady and stable. It surprised me a little bit. We've seen some, from some, at least from some other hospitals, a little more variation in average daily census from year to year. Um, but the other question related to that was you uh, listed your occupancy rates and your occupancy rate for fiscal year 22 was 44.1% per licensed bed. It was also 44.1% per staffed bed. Typically, we see there's a deviation between licensed beds and staffed beds. There wasn't one for North Country. And um, the 44% would imply that you license and staff for 36 beds, which didn't sound right to me at all. So I, I guess I'm just trying to understand those numbers. I think we'll have to go back and do that math because I agree with you because it should be, you know, there's a difference between the 25 bed critical access hospital and our license of 30, you said 36. So um, it really should be on that 25, not the 36. Okay, yeah. that's what I thought. And I just, yeah. okay. Yes, it should be a higher number. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. And we, um, I mean, although that's normal, you know, you said 16, you know, you read that 16.9, you know, I, I think you understand that we have fluctuations where, you know, in um, flu and COVID season, if I can think of all that, um, we've been, you know, 25, tw you know, 25 patients um, for a period of time or 22 plus. Um, is really where we start to say that's you know, that's really high census, or maybe it's at 21. Um, and then you have some lulls from time to time where it's like, well, we had a couple um, weeks where it was down below 16, which was actually refreshing. Um, so it's, <laughs> it's a lot. Shortage, I'm sure. Um, yeah. No, it just seemed like it was so solid and steady with literally no deviation over these years, particularly in a pandemic when there is so much fluctuation that it honestly was just a bit surprising. And even the other piece I thought was interesting was um, you're projecting that same average daily census for 23, the 16.8, um, but you're, at least from some of the materials I saw, you're expecting 17% fewer admissions. You're projecting, you know, 1,600 uh, admissions versus the 2,000 that you've had in the past few years. I recognize average length of stay may contribute to that. I just... I, if you all could just help us unpack some of that, um, some of those numbers a bit more, because I think that would be helpful. And yeah. Certainly, if you have answers now, that's great. But if you need to follow up, that's fine too. Yeah, we'll follow up. Okay, that'd be fantastic. Um, my next question is just, uh, or my next comment really is just around wait times. You know, I fully recognize that you did an EMR conversion. I, 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 we've heard over the years how challenging and difficult that can be. Um, so I understand completely that the data collection around wait times was challenging. And I really want to thank you for sharing the 3D health assessments data that you do have and for attempting to try and get a handle on those uh, wait times. My, my request is simply that as you're thinking about your new Cerner system, if it's possible to think ahead for next year and make the necessary IT changes in the, in the system to allow you to track both referral lag, which it, I think is an important metric to track. That's the time between when a referral is made and when an appointment is scheduled. And then the visit lag, which is the time between when an appointment is scheduled and when the visit actually happens. Um, you know, we've heard from primary care providers across the state that that referral lag is the source of major frustration for patients and for the providers themselves who are waiting to hear when an appointment will be scheduled for one of their patients. So I, we're trying to track both of those metrics. And if we don't measure it, we don't know whether there's a problem, we can't fix it. So now that you have a new EMR system and maybe there's a long enough runway to think about next year, my request is if you could make those adjustments in the in the system now. Yeah, we're looking to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're looking forward to that the tool that Cerner, you know, we're obviously in a high anxiety environment right now, but we're looking forward to the tools that we should be able to turn on and the, the metrics because of Cerner. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. And then my last request, it's, there's not a question here either, but, you know, to the degree I'm asking every hospital to the degree that any known or likely changes to federal and state payments any relief funds, any unexpected increases in Medicaid and Medicare rates, if you would share those with us, if they, you know, have you've learned about them since the budget submission or you learn about them in the next few weeks, if you would just update us with sure. an email with Sarah and team. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Um, I'm gonna kick it over to uh, Sarah Lindbergh to see if there's any questions from our hospital finance team. Sarah Lindbergh now off mute. Uh, no questions from staff. Just thank you for your partnership and uh, clarity in all this. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Um, at this point, then, then I will turn it over to the HCA for any questions. Thank you. Uh, apologies. I, I decided to take the exceedingly generous tact of relieving Sam from doing all 14 hospital budget hearings and generously taking two of the 14. Uh, so I question my uh, decision only to take like 6%. Um, so my first two questions are about Cerner. And um, one is that, so you might know this, but the health network, UVM Health Network purchased and implemented Epic a few years ago and is kind of currently rolling it out. Um, one of the selling points of uh, 
switching to Epic was that the network uh, would offer discounted Epic licenses to Vermont hospitals that are not in the network. Um, and I was wondering, did, did you have the option of obtaining a discounted Epic license from the network? So we, Tracy, I, I don't know that you can answer this because, um, but we, we, we would need our CIO to help us um, answer that because we did go through a process and we did look at Epic. And I can tell you that when we looked at Epic and that, so this was um, probably a year and a half ago. So I have to believe that that conceptually that that was on the table, um, but the Epic cost was Epic. <laughs> yeah. And so- I mean, that, that was to, the thing. When the we looked at this, I'm, yeah, so when I'm thinking about when we, our top three were um, Cerner, Meditech, and Epic. And Epic was the most expensive. I can't remember when Meditech fell. Um, it was it was the closest to being competitive with Cerner. Uh, so we're really looking at the top three players at the time, and um, Cerner was the more, um, uh, from an operation standpoint, um, more um, effective for not impact, impacting our financials as deeply. Yeah, if you if you could look into whether you were offered um, a discounted Epic license, that would be really helpful. Because I do know for a CAH, you know, a full price Epic license is, um, I would agree that it would be an Epic cost and perhaps yeah. totally unreasonable. Yeah. Um, so staying with Cerner, um, you mentioned that a substantial portion of the decrease uh, in cash was due to issues related to the Cerner implementation. I'm just wondering, when Cerner comes online, is that going to drop down to your operating margin? So are we going to see in 2022 or in 2023 that the operating margin would look better than it does currently, potentially? Well yeah, Eric, I would love to say that's what's going to happen, but it's not. Basically, what's happening is we're capturing the charges. So we're capturing mm -hmm. the revenue. So the revenue is going into our financials. I mean, there may be a little bit out there, but not anything of consequence. The real issue here is the cash, right? We're not yeah. able to get the bills out the doors and the cash back in the door. So it'll affect our cash balance, but it's not going to affect our total revenue. So it won't hit the bottom line. That That's really helpful. Um, so I'm going to switch switch a little bit, um, well, switch very much. Um, so I'm just a little, I wanted to understand the change in how you book bad debt. So I'm looking at 2021 where bad debt drops precipitously, almost so low that I thought it was a typo at first and we reached out to you and then it bounces back up in 2022 uh, P and 23B. And I'm, I'm not understanding the change in booking because I guess conceptually, I would have expected it to remain low in 2022 P and 2023 B if there had been a change in accounting practices. Like I wouldn't expect a one-time change is what I'm saying. Yeah, uh, Eric, you're absolutely right. And I did look into that about what the what the reasoning behind why our bad debt, I know it went up into our contractuals in 21. Um, and that's why you saw the big difference. You know, the free care remained basically the same, but the bad debt went up to into our contractuals. But then um, since then, the bad debt's back down into its own category. So, you know, I'm going to have to do a little more research on that. I'm not sure if it's just a matter of where on the adaptive reports, this is being um, put or not. So I guess I'm going to have to take do a little more research for you. I will. I mean, I will tell you overall, for the most part, besides for 21, we always hover around the two percent mark yeah. of half bad debt and half free care. Um, so you know, I'm going to have to look at that and and talk to my accounting team to see if that was a matter of which box they put it in on um, in the adaptive world. So I can definitely get back to you on that. That would be super helpful. And, you know, adaptive is kind of what everyone's pulling off of. So historically, it creates this very strange line that I don't think is true in the sense that we mean it. Um, so that that's only why I bring it up. Um, 
Absolutely. So staying on bad debt, I'm, I'm just wondering about what's driving the bad debt in commercial and self-pay. Uh, you So this was in your um, answers to our question 1C. So bad debt for commercial went from 72,000 to 1,249,000 and self-pay went from a hunch, roughly 111,000 to 900,000. And so I'm trying to, I think that's because of the issue we were just talking about. Um, so, you know, it, yeah. it goes through perhaps. Yeah, okay. I'm going to have to, yeah, I think the answer to that will be once I untangle the other piece of it, it'll, it'll all kind of fall into line. All right, and then um, the last two questions for me, and then I think Charlie has a few questions, was, um, so I, I wanna switch from the budget to a little bit to the um, community health needs assessment, which was um, quite impressive. But I wanted to ask you about, so you reported that like 48.8% of respondents to the survey um, so they took illegal or prescription drugs in a way that was not recommended by a doctor, um, and that this kind of issue was the big one of the biggest issues in your service area. Um, and then you stratified it um, by income level, and it persisted across income levels. Um, so other findings in that in your report talk about how illicit substance use has been normalized due to financial hardship and poor mental health uh, in your service area. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how you're addressing this kind of pervasive problem around illicit substance use, whether it be prescription or illegal drugs. I can speak to it and then if others want to chime in. Um, so one thing that we um, are, are working on with our um, journey to recovery, which is the local um, center here that works um, with that population, um, we've had them, um, we have 24 hour access um, to their, to their case workers essentially, so that if someone presents to the ED, we can really give them that real time um, response, you know, someone saying, hey, I'm, I'm ready to get help. We can do it real time because we all know that that's a short window if we don't access it then. Um, historically, um, our emergency department has not participated in RAM, which is the rapid um, access to medication treatment. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but we are currently on track um, with our um, medical director and um, ED staff to um, look at that, get the training for the physicians. There's some some licensing training that goes into that so that we can start prescribing that. We did have a, a meeting and talking with Journey to Recovery and also one of our um, areas uh, was Savita on how we would bridge that, you know, so the RAM, you get a one or two day dose um, of medication if you're saying you're ready to, to detox um, and then we link you with Savita or BAR in our community. Um, so that those are some really tangible things that we're doing to help um, support that population. That that's wonderful, and you know, as you know, you know the substance abuse is kind of a crisis statewide and nationally. And I sincerely hope that we can share some of the learnings that you've garnered around your project in the system as a whole. And that's kind of a sharing of systems knowledge is a constant refrain for me. But I I really do hope. Uh, we can w understand how that works at other hospitals and perhaps um, take, you know, use what you're using. Um, also related to the CNHA, um, I really appreciate that you were clear about the limitations and challenges of the survey and outreach methodology um, and that the sample you know, resulted in uh, respondents that were disproportionately free female in higher education than the community as a whole. I'm wondering, and you know, it's this is really uh, a pervasive problem with outreach and surveys is, you know, what steps you're taking for, or have you thought about taking for future community needs assessments that try to get 
a better representation of community members with diverse backgrounds regarding race, ethnicity, class, education level, gender identity, sexual orientation, et cetera? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to that, Eric. Um, you know, I, I think our window of time of doing this survey was just unfortunate because, you know, you know it's required every three years. And yeah. so we had to do this when they were right in the middle of COVID when people weren't in, actually weren't able to get yeah. together. So that's what led to a different approach. Um, I think we definitely will have a different approach the next go around. Um, we did onboard with, um, with um, um, UVM on this, this project. Um, and so I think we've established a good consistent process for moving forward um, with some population health influence, um, um, a part of the survey, um, some leadership in that aspect. And so, uh, you know, just the fact that you saw that we acknowledged it, I think shows that we acknowledge we got to do it differently next time. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, that self criticality is refreshing to see. And so I, I really, I bring that up to, uh, you know, applaud that recognition and to also legitimately, because of curiosity, to ask about how you're dealing with it, again, with the hope that what you learn can be shared across the system as a whole. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to uh, pass it off to Charlie, who I think is on, and he may have uh, a question or two. Thank you. Hi. Um, yep, I'm on. So this is Charles Becker. Uh, everyone calls me Charlie. <laughs> I'm a staff attorney with the HCA, new this year. Um, so it's nice to meet all of you. Um, and thank you for your presentation today. Um, I just wanted to ask, and really it's it's we, so this is, you know, we worked on these questions together. <laughs> so we wanted to ask you about your uh, diversity, equity, and diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. And you spoke in your presentation to some of those efforts, including, I believe, some training for staff, um, the opening of a new walk-in clinic. Um, certainly those are both really good things and you're to be commended for those efforts. But we wanted to challenge you a little bit on uh, a response that you gave to one of our uh, written questions about health equity. And um, specifically, we asked if North Country had a funded DEI position. And the response that we received was, we have no current plans to create this position at this time. We have very little racial diversity in our patient population and have received zero complaints related to racial discrimination. And so just first of all, acknowledging the reality that the counties you serve are predominantly white and not Hispanic. <laughs> um, there could be multiple interpretations for why North Country is receiving zero complaints about racial discrimination. And it could be, for example, that people of color don't feel comfortable making complaints. <laughs> so to turn this into a question, and, and maybe it's, a uh, rhetorical question. I'm, we're not intending to put anyone on the spot, but is there more that North Country could be doing short of funding a DEI position to make it clear that DEI is part of your hospital's uh, mission and culture and to ensure that the small portion of your population who are Black, Indigenous, or people of color feel welcomed at your facility? Yeah. Um, thank you for pulling that out and I'm sharing your response to that narrative. Uh, I think narrative is can be difficult and um, it, being transparent of where our plans are um, um, and what our market is was not intended to be um, abrasive. So I apologize for that. Um, you know, I think, you know, this is an area where it's difficult for us to be breaking the ice on, you know, and be the standout lead. Um, so we're looking for help um, and would ask for HCA's help um, in this regard. Um, acknowledging what our market is. Um, we have, you know, internally we have, you know, we do, we have taken steps in the last four, four years or so um, to continue to advance um, diversity within um, our hiring practices um, by taking initiatives. Um, I've said this the last couple of years of hiring international um, nurses, which does bring in people of color. Um, and different backgrounds and have um, even resulted in very small micro groups of people that are now living in our community, getting into our school systems. And so that's, you know, that's going to take years. Um, we have, um, so, so 
trying to continue to cultivate those types of opportunities. Um, um, we have had, um, most recently, um, we were very pleased to sell um, our Derby Green long-term care property that was vacant to um, an organization um, called House of Mercy that is bringing in Ukraine refugees. Um, and we have people uh, of special needs coming in through that program. The hospital's not directly, um, you know, ingrained into that work, but, uh, but that will be in our community, which will again offer in some more diversity. Um, so, um, so we're open and receptive to it. Glad to hear ideas. Um, we do work with Northern counties and um, NKHS to continue to say, hey, what can we do to continue to serve our, our community in all aspects, um, regardless of faith, background, um, gender, and we have a ways to go, um, but it's just difficult to break ice um, in an area that's not very diverse. And um, um, so welcome your, your help. Well, I say I didn't want to put anyone on the spot, but that was a really great answer. So I'm glad I gave you the opportunity to, to say all those things because you're right, it's hard to, to put all of that into a narrative. So I, I appreciate that response. And, and um, I think you made, you know, among the better points you made there, two of them were the, the the hiring, you know, bringing in people from out of your area, that that could, you know, increase the diversity of your community and also that you're open to receiving help. And so I can imagine that the um, HCA would be uh, eager to speak with you about um, what you could do along those lines. Thank you. Can I just jump in real quick, Charlie? So Brian, um, we have a few uh, parental leaves happening right now, so it's a it's a rough time for us because we're wildly understaffed. Um, but I think come November, as as you are, um, come November, or I mean, depending how the fall plays out with a potential surge, I think getting North Country. I would be happy to get you in touch with our, connect you with our outreach person, connect you with Sam, um, a health policy analyst, um, to do some conceptual work around DEI initiatives, and then also any um, stats or mapping, I'm, I'm happy to help you with. As you know, numbers are pretty hard to come by in Vermont, um, especially by county, so um, unfortunately it's probably going to be me saying we can't get the numbers uh but i'll try yeah. if there are numbers to be found sam will find i mean eric will find them so great <laughs> thank you yeah thank you charles eric and charlie is that it from you all with questions yes it is <laughs> okay great and I just want to say I love the meeting of the minds and the potential collaboration on these important issues. And I just appreciate we just saw right before our very eyes some great work that's about to happen. So appreciate, you know, the willingness to help HCA and the willingness to receive help um, North Country. So at this point, I'm going to open it up for public comment. So if there's anybody uh, in from the public that wishes to comment on this particular budget from North Country, if you could raise your hand um, using the raise your hand function in Teams, we'll see that you have a public comment to make. Okay, I'm not seeing anybody raising their hand. I just want to also offer it to anybody who's on the phone who would like to make a public comment and can't use that function. You just can start speaking now. Okay, again, I'm not hearing anybody. So um, I don't think we have any public comment today. North Country, I want to thank you again for your presentation. I think there's a lot of great work going on up there, a lot of headwinds, potentially maybe more than most faced in the state this year. And I think we can acknowledge that and appreciate your hard efforts there to overcome them. Um, you must be exhausted. So I just will acknowledge that, <laughs> you and your teams. But thank you to all your workers and everybody who's who's trying to overcome the struggles and, and you know make an effort in your communities to, to provide access to high quality care. At this point, what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to recess for the rest of the morning until 1.30 when we return and hear back from Gipper. So uh, North Country, you'll hear from our team about some follow-up questions. I think we hopefully just so we can all 
be on the same page for what those follow-up questions are. But uh, in the meantime, thank you again for, for your presentation today. Yeah, thank, thank you. you all. Yeah. And I'll see everybody back here at 1.30. Thank you.